around, guys. Uh, this is week five of the six weeks training. So next week, uh, uh, Professor Kun is going to be presenting uh, the station blackout. So about the Fukushima stuff and how uh, Torcon handling station blackout that I think that would be very interesting uh, topic for next week. And the week after that is the last session, week seven is only question and answer. So no presentation, so question and answer on week seven. So there'll be Professor Kuhn, Lars, and Manu will be there to answer all your questions. So prepare your question ahead of time, right? So on week seven. So without further ado, I present Kuhn, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, again, welcome everybody to this uh, weekly workshop on the uh, Sorkan, uh, uh, Sorkan 500 design and safety features. So let me start with sharing my screen. And I put my uh, slides into a presentation mode. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. Uh, let me just uh, open up the laser pointer. Okay. Okay. So we're in the week five of the workshop. Um, so in the past four weeks, we've been talking about the introduction of molten sort, and then we talked about the uh, the sort count five hundred general design and safety features. Uh, in week three, we had Lars and Manu uh, talking about neutronics and the thermohydraulics of the core. Uh, last week, uh, we covered the normal operations and the BOP. Um, so as, uh, as Bob said, uh, next week, we're going to talk about uh, the safety analysis and uh, some of the DBAs, uh, including the uh, station blackout, uh, which everybody is interested in. Um, but this week, uh, we're going to focus on, we're going to focus on the fuel transfer, uh, the off gas system, and also, uh, I'm going to give you a general introduction of the, uh, instrumentation and control systems. Um, so let me just start with, uh, the slides. Okay. Uh, so in this week's presentation, I'm going to uh, talk about how fuel transfer work and how off gas work and how the INC work. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the fuel transfer. And so why, why we're interested in, in fuel transfer uh, system. And this is a, a, a very uh, unique feature of the molten salt reactor. Um, we're uh, using liquid salt fuel. Um, so in this case, we, during our operation, uh, we need to transfer, and sometimes we need to add a few to the core. Sometimes we need to remove some of the few uh, from the core. Uh, most of the time for the operation, and sometimes we do that for the safety reasons. And, and you don't see this uh, very often in the LWRs, because LWRs, when they change the few, uh, they shut the rack down for a few weeks, and they do it in a campaign. Uh, but a, a molten salt reactor like Sorcon 500, we're doing this online. We're doing this uh, uh, from time to time without having to uh, stop in the, uh, stop the uh, power plant. And so uh, before we start, let me give you a, a quick review of the uh, operation modes of normal operation. Um, in last week, we covered the, uh, the the 14 modes we have identified up to this point. And in many of these modes, uh, we have to take a action to, to move the fuel around. Uh, for example, in mode two, uh, when we do the hot restart up, uh, we have to transfer the fresh fuel uh, into the can, which is the core. Um, this is um, done by uh, transfer the molten fuel sort through pipes uh, from uh, fuel shipping cask into the can. And in, mo in mode three, and 
which is again very interesting that we're adding uh, the fuel salt and saurin uh, into the primary loop uh, a little by little. Uh, we had a, uh, a, a few adding rate uh, to ensure that we reach criticality uh, step by step. So this uh, significantly different from how uh, other type of reactors, including LWR, to reach criticality. And those reactors, they do it by uh, gradually reading uh, the, the control rods, uh, while we're doing this by adding uh, additional fissile material into the system. So as you can see, uh, transfer or moving the fuel uh, is important for the operation uh, of the Zorkan reactor. And also furthermore in, in mode five, when we do the power operation, uh, we add the makeup fuel and sorum to the loop and we drain excessive fuel to the fuel drain tank. So why we're doing that? Because the, uh, the Sorcon design has very um, little excessive reactivity. So uh, when we do this operation uh, in the four years, we have to uh, uh, add the fissile material as we consume it. So we don't add all the fissile materials uh, from the very beginning, we added step by step. And this feature actually help us to um, maintain the excessive fissile material in the core to a minimal level. And because we're adding new fuel, we're adding new fissile material, we have to drain uh, excessive fuel to keep the volume of fuel uh, to a, uh, a relative constant value. So, that's, so that would happen uh, in mode five. And of course, uh, in mode nine, uh, when we do the code shutdown, we drain all the fuel uh, from the, the part from the primary loop to the fuel drain tank. And after we drain the uh, fuel drain tank, uh, in mode 10, we um, transfer fuel out of the fuel drain tank to either a, a used fuel holding tank, in that case, uh, we're done with fuel, or if the fuel uh, can still be used, then we transfer to another can. Um, sometimes when we drain the uh, fuel into the fuel drain tank, we decide to reuse it in the same can. So in that case, we will transfer the fuel back uh, to the primary loop. Uh, so as you can see, throughout the, the operation uh, of Sorkong power plant, we have to move the fuel sort around. So that um, requires us to have a, a fuel transfer system, which you don't usually see in LWR. Okay, so let me go to the next slide. Okay, so to give you uh, a general picture uh, of how we do this, um, I'm, I'm showing you this fuel transfer diagram, which of all costs, uh, uh, it's simplified a lot. Uh, we don't show uh, many information and features on the diagram. We only show uh, the basic uh, fuel transfer routes. So if you look at this uh, uh, from the top left corner, and, and this is the fuel shipping cask. So we have a, a can ship that trans transport the fresh fuel um, to the power plant. And, and then in mode, mode two, uh, we melt the fuel and transfer it uh, from the shipping cask uh, into uh, the can, which is first to the header tank and then and go to the pot. And as we mentioned, we do makeup fuel and we add, also add sorin fuel. So there's a two other tanks in the can which I will show you the picture of those cans in the uh, later slides. But there, there's the makeup fuel tank. In that tank, uh, we have fissile materials in, so we can add fissile materials uh, into, the, uh, into the primary system. And why we're having the sorin tank? Because 
by adding makeup fuel, we actually increase the uh, uh, fissile material load in the core. And by adding thorium tank, we actually, uh, sorry, by adding thorium, uh, we actually dilute the fuel. Uh, we actually decrease uh, the fissile material load uh, in, the, uh, in the core. So uh, by having those two tanks, uh, we're able to adjust the fissile material load in the core. Um, when, when we do the operation, um, after some time, we consumed uh, the fissile material. We need to add more fissile material. So we add a, a makeup fuel into the system. But in order to keep the uh, total stored volume in, uh, in the core, we have to drain uh, some excessive uh, fuel sort out of the primary loop of the core. So there's a route. Uh, from header tank. So once the volume reaches a certain level, uh, it will overflow, uh, go out of the header tank and to the fuel drain tank. So this happens during the normal, normal operation. Um, but what if we have some uh, uh, incident that we want to uh, stop the operation? Uh, for example, uh, it, it doesn't have to be an accident. Uh, just during the normal operation, if the, the can reaches a, a four years lifetime, we need to replace it. Uh, first of all, we have to drain uh, all the sort from the core to the fuel drain tank. So that's how we do it. We have a, a freeze valve, uh, we melt it, and the uh, sort will drain to the fuel drain tank. So, however, the fuel drain tank uh, will be replaced uh, with the can. So they have a, a same design lifetime of four years. So before we replace the uh, can, the fusion tank, we have to remove the fuel. And how we do it, uh, we push the fuel, the sword in the fusion tank uh, into a cruise, which is about, which is uh, above the fusion tank, but uh, are still within the can. And then we further uh, suck it uh, into a manifold. So here, um, we actually have uh, several options. Uh, if we think, um, let's say we uh, incidentally uh, did the drain, we want to get a few back to the uh, uh, the same uh, part to, to continue the operation. In that case, we can uh, direct the fuel sort back to the header tank. And or uh, we are, we're going to replace the, uh, the can and fuel drain tank, but the fuel sort is still uh, usable. Um, so in that case, we pump it into the other can, which just next to uh, this can within the same uh, power module. Or uh, we think the fuel uh, has done its work. It has been eight years, it cannot be reused. Uh, then uh, we will pump it to a used fuel holding tank uh, uh, for storage. So after it stays in the uh, used fuel holding tank for a while, it will be first uh, pumped to the used fuel storage boat. So this just show you the basic fuel transfer route. It doesn't have the, all the valves. It doesn't have all the pumps. Uh, it doesn't show uh, the gas lines, uh, but it gives you a the big picture of how we usually uh, move the fuel sort. Um, and several uh, features I want to point out is that if you notice this, uh, uh, the boundary here, and all these components, the makeup tanks, uh, header tank, fuel drain tank, and the crews, they're all within the can. And the can is filled with helium. So the can has a, a design life of a, a uh, four years. So that means we have to replace every four years. And that's why we have this double valves here. Uh, when we uh, replace it, we can just cut, the, we can just shut the valves and replace the sections in between the valves. Then we can remove the, uh, the whole thing. Um, there's a multiple barriers exist. Um, outside of the 
the can, we have the uh, uh, can cello. Uh, so there's another uh, uh, barrier against the release of radioactive materials. And of course, uh, other uh, components are in their gas type sections. Uh, some are in the, uh, in the top sections, some are in the bottom sections in the uh, can cello basement. Uh, um, oh, sorry about that. And this should actually be uh, the uh, secondary heat exchanger set of basement, but it's still uh, flooded with water. Um, so the components here, the manifold, which, which uh, we also have a lot of uh, 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 pumps, uh, compressors, which are not shown here. Uh, but it's in this section that is above all the basement. So um, that gives us a, a easy access for maintenance. Uh, but again, everything uh, is all in the, uh, uh, either in the can cellar hall or in the uh, uh, second heat exchange hall. So again, we're maintaining three barriers here. Okay, uh, hopefully uh, I have explained uh, uh, the the general uh, fuel transfer routes to you. Um, so let's go to the next slide. So I'll give you a more clear picture on where uh, those components are. Uh, from the left, as you can see, in the middle is a pot. Uh, and then this one uh, is the uh, uh, fuel makeup tank. And this one is the storing tank. Uh, here, if you can see, uh, it's a header tank. And then, of course, at the bottom uh, is the fuel drain tank. And there's a small process, as if you can see here, um, that, that's the process uh, which you can push the sort uh, from the fuel drain tank into the cruise first and then suck it out uh, uh, to the manifold. And the pipe, the pipings are not shown on the picture. It just uh, want to show you clearly where those, uh, uh, those tanks are. And here's a, a plan view. Uh, as you can see, you, we have a, a, a pump here and header tank on top, uh, primary heat exchanger, and then we have this makeup fuel tank, and also we have the sorting tank. Uh, there's two other large tanks, which you see here, uh, is the off-gas uh, recuperators. Uh, which will cover that in the uh, second part of this uh, presentation. Okay, so let's take a closer look uh, at the fuel transfer components. Uh, so here is the fuel drain tank, which is at the bottom of the can. Um, this is the fuel drain tank. Um, this is the cruise. And then you can see there's a, a, a drain lines here. If you look from the top, uh, you see there's a, 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 a sections of a, a, a fuel drain tank. There's a small setting, a setting drink tanks. Um, it, it was designed in such ways uh, so that there's several benefits. And one is the, uh, of course, it's gonna maintain sub criticality. And also, it will be either for cooling. Uh, we have this cold wall uh, surrounding those uh, filtering tanks, both outside and inside. Uh, so it, it will give us optimal cooling of the uh, irradiated fuel in the filtering tank. And also by uh, having this uh, uh, filtering tank in this shape, uh, in this shape, uh, it will also um, Give us a, a, a better performance when you when you drink the hot salt into into the tank. Uh, the tank will sustain the thermal stress of the uh, hot fuel salt. And as you can hear, see here is the cruise. Um, okay, so let's uh, move on to. So let's uh, talk about how exactly uh, can we get the fuel salt out of the drain tank. So uh, the drain is happening 
and naturally it's done by uh, gravity. So nothing uh, needs to be done uh, for the drain to happen. So that's how the, the uh, fuel, fuel salt can drain from the, uh, the pot into the fuel drain tank. Again, this is not to scale. Uh, it, it just uh, show you how uh, this thing would work. Um, of course, there is need uh, a drain vent because if you have salt uh, drains into uh, the fuel drain tank, uh, the gas in the fuel drain tank, which in this case is uh, helium, will have some space to go. So it got a connection back to the header tank. So when you drain it, uh, this uh, drain vent will keep the pressure. And once the fuel salt is drained into the fuel drain tank, how can we get the fuel salt out? We do that by uh, using pressurized helium cover gas. Um, so here's how we do this. Um, you, you see there's a, a pipe dip to the bottom of the uh, fuel drain tank. And here we have a valve. Um, there should be uh, another valve here, but now shown on the uh, on the picture. So the first step is to get the fuel sort out of the fuel drain tank into the cruise. So we do it by uh, using the, uh, the vacuum pump. So we uh, suck the uh, sort. So we uh, shut this valve off and we open this valve and then we uh, uh, we use the vacuum pump to suck helium. So the salt will be uh, sucked out of the uh, fuel drain tank to the cruise. And once the fuel salt in the cruise, uh, we shut this uh, valve off, but open this one. And, and then we uh, use helium gas to uh, press. So then we push uh, the fuel salt from the cruise uh, back to the to the manifold, and the manifold, of course, uh, have uh, connections uh, to uh, several other parts. Uh, for example, to other uh, can or to the uh, used fuel holding tank, or or back to the header tank, which are not shown on the screen. Um, so, as you can see, uh, the the main method. Uh, to move the fuel salt around is using the helium gas. So the helium gas is uh, supplied and by an advantage to the off gas system, uh, as you can see uh, on the most right side. Um, the, the helium gas is being attached with the fuel salt, so uh, it's, it's going to be contaminated. Uh, when when we use the uh, irradiated fuel. So the gas has to be collected by the uh, off gas system and uh, it has to be uh, cleaned up and re recirculated back to the system. So, so helium gas is very important uh, for us to uh, move the fuel sort around. And so the, the system was designed such that uh, all the fuel transfer pumps and most of the valves are in great sections. So uh, I don't know if you remember the, uh, the overall uh, structure of the power plants, but this uh, great section uh, is above the, uh, uh, the can cello. So it, it can be accessed uh, from top uh, for maintenance. So we can actually uh, replace the pumps, uh, especially replace the model, the models and control units if we um, if we have to. Okay, so uh, I just explained how we uh, move the fuel fuel sort around. Uh, basically, we're doing that by using helium cover gas. So uh, it, it's obvious. Uh, that helium gas, the cover gas, uh, plays an important role uh, in the uh, uh, 
in the SOCOM 500. So let's uh, uh, talk about how we can handle uh, the helium gas. So the next section, uh, we're going to introduce off gas system. Again, this system is uh, it's quite unique to molten salt reactor. Um, because uh, the cover gas, the, especially the fuel cover gas, plays some important functions uh, for the SOCOM 500. And also, I believe it is important for all the liquid fuel molten salt reactors. Um, so uh, the first function, as I just shown to you, uh, the helium gas, the cover gas, is used to uh, transfer the fuel salt. Uh, but there's other important functions. Uh, for example, um, the helium gas is also a dry seal of the pump. Uh, so the pump, the pump shaft is a moving uh, component. Actually, it's a, it's a very few uh, moving components of the system. So it needs a seal um, and we use a, a helium gas as a dry seal gas. Uh, and the third function is to uh, remove the, the neutron poisons, uh, especially the, uh, uh, the xenons, kryptons uh, from the fuel. So um, the, the benefit of using a liquid fuel uh, is that you can actually uh, remove uh, some of the fission products from the fuel uh, online. So in the in the uh, liquid fuel reactor, uh, the fuel usually is sealed in the flooding materials, so you don't have access to it. Uh, when you when the fuel uh, burn up increase, the the fuel pins will be pressurized. And to a point, you have to uh, remove the fuel pin from the core. But for the uh, liquid fuel, you don't have those fuel pins. Um, you have cover gas on top of the fuel. So you have the option to remove uh, venons, kryptons, and several other uh, volatile fission products from the fuel online. So and that, that is the job of the uh, uh, fuel cover gas. And we're choosing helium uh, as the cover gas because helium is stable. Um, it cannot be uh, activated. Uh, it's not radioactive. So it, it's very good gas uh, um, for this purpose. So uh, because the the cover gas is in touch uh, with the fuel salt. So once the fuel salt is irradiated, um, the cover gas will be contaminated. Um, so there's uh, several main uh, source terms uh, that is in the, the cover gas. Uh, for example, there's, uh, there's uh, noble gases like uh, krypton and xenon. Um, there, will, there will also be some uh, volatile elements such as iodine. Um, there's also uh, a salt mist and, and vapor. Uh, even though during the normal operation, the, uh, uh, the salt vapor pressure is low, but there's still some uh, salt mist and vapor. Also, there might be some small particles, which are uh, fission products that are not uh, uh, soluble in the in the fuel salt, so there might be some small particles. So all these uh, contaminants will be in the oh, will be in the cover gas. So uh, once the cover gas uh, emitted uh, from the primary loop, it's also called the off gas because it's contaminated, um, and we have to we have to do something about the off gas. So that is the job of the off gas system. And here, is the, here are the main functions of the off gas system. The, first of all, it has to uh, supply and circulate helium cover gas uh, in the system. 
And, and second of all, it has to uh, cool the off gas and return most of the heat back to the primary loop. So the off gas uh, is from the fuel. It's on top of the fuel, it, it is also from the fuel. So uh, it has the uh, radioactive isotopes, uh, which contains heat, which generates haze when it's the case. Um, also, it, um, the off gas, once in touch with the sword, it has the same temperature as the sword. So the off gas system has to cool it down. Uh, and also it has to return uh, the heat back to the primary loop because I will show in the later slides that if you don't return the heat, uh, it will result in a, uh, a waste of energy. Um, and then the off gas system has to remove um, the radioactive isotopes and also to contain them. Uh, so there's no uh, other way of uh, uh, getting rid of radioactive, radioactive isotopes except, uh, except for uh, letting it decay in the system. Um, during that uh, process, the system has to contain the radioactive isotopes. Um, and also, uh, the operation of the uh, molten salt reactor uh, will uh, generate krypton and venom. Um, so we have to separate those gases uh, from helium so that we can return uh, the helium back to the system to circulate. And, and also the system, the off-gas system will also remove other unwanted gases, mist, and particles from the off-gas. So let's go into the detail to see how we do that. Okay, now here is a very complicated uh, uh, process flow diagram. But if we go um, from uh, left to right, uh, you will see it's not uh, as complicated as it uh, seems to be on the screen. So let's start with the header tank. Um, so this tank is above the, uh, the pump where the, uh, the, the, off gar, the off gas is generated. As you can see, it's at a high temperature with the same temperature uh, as the fuel. Um, and then the thermal power shown here uh, is, is uh, how much heat uh, those off gas will generate uh, in the header tank. As you see, the heat power is quite high. It's 1.1 megawatt. So we want to, but uh, the, the header tank is within the, uh, the can. So this heat will be returned to the parameter loop. So it won't be wasted. And the dwelling time uh, in this header tank is about one, 0 0.7 days. So this is a very important because as I mentioned, the, uh, the main uh, method of uh, removing the uh, radioactive isotope is to let it stay there and let it decay. So the longer uh, the gas can stay in the uh, component, the better. So in the header tank, it only stays for uh, 0 0.7 days. And then the off gas move on to uh, the off gas recuperators, number one, which we just uh, saw it in the uh, uh, 3D view of the can. So as you can see, the volume is much larger uh, compared to the header tank and the temperature goes down uh, and also the thermal power uh, is much less because most of the thermal power uh, is generated by uh, the short-lived uh, isotopes, which has already decayed in the header tank. Uh, again, the off-gas will stay uh, in the recuperator one for only 2.2 days. Uh, so I will show you how this works in the next uh, a few sites, but let's keep going to the second one. Um, the second one, again, it's exactly the same as the first. It has same volume, but as you can see, the temperature keeps keeps going down here. Um, and the thermal power is also going down because additional uh, isotopes have 
decayed already, so it generates much less uh, heat uh, in the recuperator number two. And the, and the dwelling time is uh, a little bit longer uh, in this one. Um, and then it will go to a filter. Uh, this filter will remove uh, residual particles and mist. So uh, as you can see, when the temperature goes from 700 to all the way to about 200, uh, most of the few, most of the salt mist and vapor uh, will uh, deposit uh, in these two rec recuperators. But uh, we still have another filter uh, to remove uh, the residual particles and the mist. And all these components, the four components, they're all uh, within the can. So they have a, a lifetime of four years. They will be replaced uh, with the can. So once all the gas is out of the filter, uh, it will also uh, out of the, uh, the can. Uh, it will enter uh, the, the, the hold-up tanks, uh, which you will have two hold-up tanks. Uh, they're all in the uh, uh, secondary heat exchanger cell basement. Uh, as you can see, the hold-up tanks are much larger. Um, they're um, almost uh, over 20 times larger than the recuperators and the temperature further goes down. Uh, thermal power again. Uh, now you see this thermal power is uh, a bit larger than this because the volume is, uh, is much larger. Um, the dwelling time um, is 108 days and this one is 105 days. So um, uh, up to this point, as you can see, um, we're, we're letting uh, the off gas stay in these tanks uh, for some time and letting the, uh, uh, the radioactive isotopes to decay. Um, as you can see, most of the short-lived ones will decay within the can in the recuperators. Um, the longer-lived one uh, will decay out of the can in the hold-up tanks. And after the hold-up tanks, it will go to the chuckle bed. And the chuckle bed can uh, retain the xenon for a very long time. Uh, it has a, um, less uh, dwelling time for uh, the creep time. But again, uh, the purpose is to uh, let off gas stay here, uh, let off gas uh, the radioact isotope to decay. Um, by the time that the off gas is out of the charcoal bed, um, there's uh, the majority of the, uh, uh, the off gas are non radioactive. Um, there's a krypton 85 left, which has a very long half life, so it won't decay much uh, in, in, uh, in, in those tanks and charcoal bed. And the other uh, non radioactive xenon and krypton will enter uh, the cold trap. So, the purpose of the cold trap is to separate the krypton and xenon from helium because the helium will be returned uh, to the system, will be recirculated back to the system uh, to be used as the cover gas. And the the way the cold trap work is very simple. Uh, it lowers the temperature um, because uh, krypton and venom has a, a much a higher uh, liquidifying and solidifying temperature. So uh, it will be separate from the helium. Um, so the krypton and the xenon, uh, including krypton 85, will be pushed to the collection bottles and while the uh, the helium will go back uh, to the system. Um, I will show you how the cold trap and the collection bottles are working in the future slides, but let's uh, keep going with this route. 
and it will go to the uh, oxygen and treat him better. And the purpose of it is first of all to remove oxygen and also to remove a uh, tritium from the system. Uh, we're using nickel and titanium absorber. Um, I need to point it out that uh, because SOCON 500 is using uh, sodium and iridium fluoride, uh, we're not using lithium. So the tritium generation from the power plant is actually much less uh, than uh, those reactors were using lithium. So there's not a significant generation of tritium from the power plant. So this scatter will be uh, more than adequate to uh, absorb the, the uh, residue tritium from the system. And after this, uh, the off gas has pretty much be cutting the nap. Uh, it will go to the recirculation compressor, and then it goes to the filter. Again, this filter uh, has the capability of uh, removing particles that are larger than one micron. So uh, after this, it will go to the flow regulator. Uh, it controls the flow of the whole system, and then it pushed back to the uh, the pump and goes through the dry gas seal and back to the header tank. So uh, all of this calculations, this threading time, this thermal power, they're all based on a uh, operating flow rate of two liters per minute. So there's a possibility that we can uh, increase it or decrease as needed. Uh, but in, in a normal operation, the flow rate will be kept at two liters per minute, which is adequate for the operation of the system. Um, there's also a, a makeup hitting bottle here. Uh, it supplies fresh helium, um, which is obviously necessary because when we start the system, we need the helium from somewhere. And also, there, there are going to be uh, some leak, uh, and then you have to supply additional helium. There's also other functions like uh, using helium to uh, flush the system. Uh, again, so this this process flow diagram show how this uh, system will work. Um, so. Let's go to the next one. So the next one, um, I'm also showing you a process flow diagram. I call it functional um, because this one is much simpler than the first one. Uh, it summarizes the uh, flow diagram you just saw um, by functions. So uh, how exactly we did this? So from the fuel thought, uh, we first do what we call the in-can decay, which we decay the off-gas uh, for 6.5 days within the can. And there's a 1.5 megawatt decay heat uh, generated. And these components will be replaced every four years. So this basically uh, a summarize of the uh, this trip blocks, actually four blocks, because they're all in the can. It can be replaced and will be replaced every four years. And then um, the second step is out of can decay. Again, the method is also uh, letting the, uh, uh, the radioactive isotopes to decay, but it's done outside the can. Um, a total of uh, 246 days for Krypton and 1,674 days for Zena. Um, you can see that thermal power is much less. Um, the design lifetime is actually 80 years because this, these components are outside of the camp. Um, it will stay there, it won't be 
replaced. And after the two step of decay, we go back to the, uh, we go to the separation, which is a cold trap. Um, so this basically uh, remove the krypton and venom from helium. Um, again, uh, except for the, the moving parts, uh, the system is uh, designed for 80 years operation. And of course, the pressurized storage bottles can be replaced once it's full. Um, it has a four years design lifetime. So we can replace the bottles with the cans. Uh, and, it, and then it circulates back to, uh, back to the system. So as you can see for the whole uh, system, we replace the, the in-can decay components with the can every four years. And we replace the bottles once it's filled. Uh, everything else are uh, for 80 years operation. So uh, we do this uh, uh, simplified flow, the flow diet run for purpose because um, in the next slide, we're gonna introduce the, the modes of operation. In this case, the uh, simplified uh, uh, process flow diagram will help to explain the modes of operation. So uh, up to this point, we're, we're only uh, introducing the normal operation. As you can see uh, from the fuel sort, we let it decay, uh, we do separation, uh, and then we recircuit it back to the system. So here is our uh, helium gas circulation in the normal operation. Uh, but we have other um, modes of operation. Uh, for example, we have regeneration mode. So what happened in this mode? Uh, in this mode, um, um, so we push the uh, xenon and krypton that were separated from the system into uh, the storage bottles uh, while we supply fresh helium um, to the system uh, and for the operation. So uh, during the regeneration mode, we don't have to stop the reactor. We can continue it operated uh, using fresh helium while we do this uh, uh, storage. And, and then we also have the purge mode. So in the purge mode, as you can see, uh, while we're supplying fresh helium uh, to the system to keep the system operating. And we can also uh, flash the circulation part of the system. We uh, basically purge the system to clean it up. And then we push the, uh, uh, the gases into the storage bottle. Why we're doing that? Because uh, these parts, the circulation, the separation, uh, they have a, a moving parts. So uh, by doing this, we cleaned up the system, uh, we can do the maintenance. And the other parts, however, the decay part, they only have tanks, uh, charcoal bed filters, uh, they don't have to uh, be, be maintained. Um, so a, they will just function as they were, and the moving parts can be uh, uh, maintained after being cleaned that. So uh, to explain this better, uh, let's go to uh, each of the components to see how it works. Uh, here's how the off-gas recuperator works. Um, the recuperator is a very simple design. It's basically just stainless steel vessels. Uh, so the off-gas flows up and down. Uh, through the centric rings of plate. So those are, again, are, are stainless steel. So uh, the gas flows in from here and it goes up and down and all the way here and back to uh, the uh, exit of the recuperator. So the purpose of this 
design is just to let the gas stays in the recuperator for as long as possible. Um, how, exactly how long the gas can stay in the recuperator uh, will be based on the flow rate. Uh, so we have a, a flow regulator that controls the flow rate. So uh, we can uh, anticipate uh, how much uh, isotopes will be decayed in the recuperators. Um, of course, the, uh, the daughter product remains uh, remain in the recuperators. Uh, we have a, a, a materials that are in the recuperator to absorb uh, those daughter products, especially those metals. Um, the mist and the vapor uh, will deposit in the recuperators um, when the temperature decreases. Remember when they off gas just out of the uh, the fuel source, the temperature is above 700. Um, but once it goes through uh, two recuperators, uh, the temperature will go down to about uh, uh, 200. In that case, uh, most of the uh, uh, mist and vapor will deposit in the inner surface of the recuperators. Um, the, re the, the two recuperators, they're all within the can, uh, so they're uh, the cooled by uh, the cold wall, and also it will be replaced with the can every four years. Now there's a off gas holding tanks outside of the can, uh, which has very similar design as this. Uh, the only difference is that uh, the holding up tanks are much larger than the recuperated in can, and holding tanks in the uh, secondary heat exchanger cell basement, which is uh, flooded by water and cooled by water. Okay, uh, the cold traps. So how the cold traps work? Again, it's very simple. I mean, uh, all this off gas system up to this point, uh, we have not used uh, any uh, totally new technology. They're all uh, mature technologies. So in the cold trap, as the name says, uh, we're uh, using temperature um, to separate the uh, xenon krypton from helium. Um, so during the normal operation, uh, once the uh, the off gas pass through the, the cold trap, because the temperature is quite low, so uh, the xenon and krypton will be uh, solidified and the helium gas will pass through. So there will be a accumulation of solid xenon and krypton in the cold trap. Um, and then in the, in the purge mode, uh, we uh, shut off the valves and then we increase the temperature of the cold trap. Uh, so that will melt uh, the xenon and krypton and will be drained uh, to the evaporator. Uh, and then up to that point, after the drain is done, uh, we turn off the uh, valve V2 and V4. So um, the temperature increase is quite uh, fast. So uh, after a few hours, uh, we can uh, leave the purge mode. We can allow the, the cover gas to pass through again. So it won't uh, uh, interfere with the normal operation. And once the liquid then on and Krypton is in the evaporator. Uh, we will shut off V2 and V4, but uh, open V3 and V5. So uh, this V3 and V5 are connected with storage bottles. Um, what happened next is we uh, warm up the evaporator to the room temperature. And as you can imagine, they, it, it will increase the pressure. So basically the pressure will be increased to about over 40 bars in this case. So then uh, this uh, evaporator connected with uh, the bottle uh, will be filled with a high pressure rise xenon and krypton. And we, once we've done that, we uh, shut off the V3 and V5. 
now the uh, the gases, the venom and krypton gas in the bottles uh, will be pressurized. So uh, as you can see, we can fill uh, the bottles without using any pumps here. The only uh, valves uh, turn on and turn off and temperature uh, temperature rise to room, to room temperature. So again, uh, this, this uh, uh, design is quite simple and mature. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at those components and see uh, where they are. So if within the can, uh, as you can see here is the header tank. And, and then now the next to it are the recuperators uh, with the piping and the valves are not shown here, of course. Um, on the right, uh, we can see here the blue parts of the Cold War. So that's where the can is. Uh, and these two tanks here uh, are the uh, off-gas uh, ODAP tanks. Uh, here is the charcoal bed. And now here is the uh, storage bottles for Venom and uh, Krypton. They're all in the uh, secondary heat exchanger basement and flooded by water. So uh, as you can see, uh, we have a, a two power module and each will have their own uh, off-gas systems. Okay, here's the, uh, another view of those components. Um, so here is the, the can, uh, and here is the uh, uh, secondary heat exchanger cell. This is a basement. Uh, as you can see, here is the off-gas holding tank. Uh, looking from the top, uh, you'll be able to see uh, this is a cold trap right here. Um, and then there's a, a, a helium makeup, uh, and also there's the recirculation of helium. Um, from this side, uh, which is underneath the uh, uh, look from the top of the uh, secondary heat change cell basement, you see on two sides there's a, a hold up tanks and there's a venom pound storage bottles, uh, charcoal bag. Uh, uh, so each, this only shows uh, one power module. So one power module has two cans. There's an, another power module, so they will have an independent uh, of gas systems. Okay, so uh, let's give, uh, since you know where the components are, let's take another look. Um, at the, uh, how these uh, systems are connected and where the containment boundary is. So uh, the header tank, off-gas recuperators and filter, uh, they're all within the can, uh, which is filled by uh, helium. Um, and then out of the can, there's a can cello. Uh, we have, again, we have a double valves here. So we can replace the can every four years. Uh, and then outside of the, uh, uh, the can cello, uh, this uh, off gas will go to the secondary heat exchanger cell basement, which is uh, flooded with water. And here we have a, a hold up tanks uh, and also charcoal bed. Um, and then we have this, uh, uh, cold trap and uh, oxygen and uh, treatment gather uh, in the gas tight section of the grid. Uh, and also the filters, recirculation, and the flow regulators, uh, makeup here in bottles, they're all in the another uh, gas tight sections. So every uh, all the pipes uh, and the uh, tanks, they have a double steel wall. So that's already two barriers. And then you got this uh, uh, secondary heat exchanger cell basement. So they have third uh, 
barrier. And here, um, the gas tight section is a barrier. And also, uh, these sections are all in the cancel uh, cell, which is the third barrier. So as you can see, uh, every uh, part of the off-gas system has maintained the uh, three barriers against release. Again, not all the uh, valves and pumps are shown uh, on the uh, picture here. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at this, the performance uh, of the uh, uh, off-gas system in terms of uh, removing uh, the, the isotopes. So uh, we're using the heat at the indicator because when, when the isotope decays, it generates heat. So um, where the heat is actually indicate uh, where the, uh, the isotope is. Uh, so as you can see, most of the krypton and xenon uh, will remain in the can, which you can see the header tank, uh, uh, recuperator one and two, they're both in the can. So the majority of the uh, fission gases will decay in the can, which will be replaced every four years. There are uh, certain isotopes has a relatively longer uh, half-life, can get out of the, uh, the can and enter into the holdout tanks, which including uh, Krypton 85, which has very long half-life, which uh, will uh, remain in the system uh, for a long time. But the other ones, uh, like a Xenon 131M, Xenon um, 133, uh, even though they will be able to uh, leave the, the can, but it will, they will decay uh, within the uh, holdup tank and chuckle bed. So as you can see, after the off-gas, uh, after chuckle bed, the off-gas, uh, contains mainly krypton-85 as the radioactive uh, isotope. And, and this krypton-85 will be uh, separated from helium gas in the cold trap. Uh, so once the um, helium gas get back to uh, the re recirculation, uh, it, it will be, it will not be the same as the fresh helium. It still may have some a very minor contamination, but it's very close to fresh helium. Okay, so uh, as we mentioned, the the fission gases decay in the uh, in the system. But what happened to the the daughter products in the system? Um, those daughter isotopes will accumulate uh, in the off-gas system. So we did a, a calculation. Here's the, uh, some of the major uh, daughter products, as you can see here. Um, so the header, uh, the header tank and recuperator, they're replaced every four years. So these are the uh, accumulation for four years. Uh, the holdup tanks and charcoal bed, their lifetime is 80 years. So those are the numbers for uh, 80 years accumulation. So uh, here's, as you can see, how this isotope will stay. Uh, and most of the daughter products will be in, uh, in the can, which will be replaced every four years. Uh, the uh, cesium uh, will be the major uh, daughter products uh, in the uh, hold-up tanks and the charcoal bed, along with uh, our RB85. Okay, so uh, up to this point, we have uh, introduced both fuel, fuel transfer system and uh, off-gas uh, system. So we're doing this because these two systems are quite unique. Uh, to the liquid fuel molten salt reactor. Therefore, it's uh, unique to uh, SOCOM 500, uh, which you don't usually see uh, in the LWRs. 
Um, so understanding uh, those how those two systems uh, are working is very important for uh, understanding how the SOCOM 500 uh, will work. And also when we uh, do the safety assessment, we have to take into uh, those into consideration. Um, there's a, a, a pros and cons of having those systems. Uh, the benefit, of course, uh, it, it makes the uh, operation much easier. Um, it actually eliminated uh, a many of the uh, potential incidents or accidents. Um, but the system itself, uh, as a system, it may fail. So when we do the safety assessment, we have to uh, consider the situation that when how uh, the plan will behave when those systems fail, uh, which we will cover it in the next week. Um, but um, for the remaining time of this presentation, uh, I'd like to give you a very short introduction on the instrumentation and the control system. Uh, so uh, let's review uh, the IEA definition of the plant items first. So, so based on the IEA definition here, the plant equipment uh, will be divided into items important safety and items non important safety. So the items uh, including uh, means structures, systems, and components. Now, if the items have a safety function, uh, it will be uh, classified as important to safety. Otherwise, it will uh, be not important to safety. Within the items important safety, there's the safety related items, there's safety systems, uh, there's safety features. So the safety features are mainly for DEC, the design tension conditions, um, while the, uh, the safety related items, those are uh, usually uh, storage tanks, pipings, and things um, that are not uh, uh, um, you can uh, you can think of those systems are not as important as the safety systems. So within safety systems, there's a, a protection system, uh, which is part of the IMC. Um, there's also safety actuation system. For example, uh, the uh, mechanism, the mechanism that drop the uh, shutdown rods uh, will be uh, the safety act actuation system. And also their safety system support feature. For example, uh, if, if one of the system requires uh, cooling or power supply, uh, then uh, those power supply and cooling system will be uh, seeing as the uh, safety system supporting features. Okay, so knowing that we can uh, go to uh, the uh, SOCOM instrument and control system. So I I like to start with the control philosophy of the SOCOM 500. Um, the SOCOM 500 plan has a, a control philosophy that is different from that of the LWRs uh, due to the intrinsic characteristics of the plant. Um, there are several reasons that the, uh, the control philosophy will be different. The number one is the, uh, the event that happens to SOCOM 500 will evolve uh, much slower uh, compared to those LWRs. Uh, the SOCOM 500 tends to have a a relatively larger uh, safety margins. Uh, the, uh, the incident, the event, uh, will evolve much slower. Uh, so that gives the, um, in, in many cases, uh, the SOCOM 500 can return to safe uh, states uh, without the uh, intervention of the operators. And it will uh, not require the operator to uh, take immediate action based on limited information. 
so the overall requirements uh, for the control uh, is, is less stringent uh, compared to the LWRs. And so the, the SORCON, as, as we have introduced in the last week, uh, the SORCON power control system is a load following system. So the power plants can automatically follow the load uh, of the uh, grid. Uh, so <clears throat> the system is also not important to safety because the, the power control system is separate uh, from the safety system. And furthermore, uh, the Stockholm 500 uses automation to replace most uh, manual inputs from the operators. So, uh, in, because uh, Stockholm 500 has uh, um, <clears throat> the, the intrinsic char characteristics of the Stockholm 500 different from LWRs. Uh, and also we have used a lot of automations. Uh, so the requirements for the operator is quite different from uh, the LWRs. So basically the operators of the SOCOM 500 have limited the required functions. So we have li listed uh, several functions that the operators might have to do. Um, first of all, the one of the function is to interface with grid um, because the grid may require a, a different electric output. Um, and then the, operate, the operators will be in charge of the uh, change of the uh, change operating modes. Um, so during the power operation, the operators don't have to do a lot of things. Everything, uh, almost everything is automated. Uh, what operators need to do um, more is when we do the uh, can change. So you have to open the system, you have to uh, lift the cans, you have to install uh, the pipings, valves, and those are the time the operator may have to do a, a more things. And so, uh, the operators need to change the plant modes uh, to enable that to happen. Um, and then the operators will have to configure the plant for maintenance. Um, in the rare cases, the operator might need to initiate a scram or drain. Uh, we give this, we give operator uh, this choice, uh, but we're not expecting them to do it very often because uh, the system will do it automatically. Uh, and then uh, the, op the operators, of course, we have to do some non-nuclear um, emergency response, like fire uh, emergency uh, or, or, or some other like weather conditions. So uh, overall, um, the SOLCON 500 will have much less uh, uh, control system that are important to safety. And SOCOM 500 will have a, a automatic system uh, combined with the uh, inherent safety. Uh, the operators are not required to uh, take immediate action to uh, keep the uh, power plant safe. So uh, the focus of the operator will be on operation. So how to make this uh, uh, power plants uh, operate more efficiently? Uh, how to make it uh, uh, more economically. So having said that, um, let me just give you a, a, a very much simplified uh, IC architecture uh, of the plant. Um, so first of all, we have uh, uh, the protection system. Uh, which basically um, shut the act down, uh, keep the emergency cooling and those kind of things. Um, in this case, most of the cans, uh, in most of the case, just shut the rack down by either uh, 
shutdown rods or drain the fuel sort. And uh, in some cases, there might be some valves need to be uh, uh, shut off and turned down, but uh, uh, we expect that the uh, actions will be uh, very limited. Um, there's a, a lot of control system about the, uh, the operation. Um, there's a power control system. Uh, there's the fuel transfer and the makeup control system, as we just introduced the fuel transfer system. Um, there's off gas control system. Um, there's salt loops control system. So what happened to the salt loops control system? Um, there's a, for each power module, there's a three salt loops. Uh, we have to have the heaters to heat it up. Uh, we have to use a flash sort as we introduced uh, in the uh, week four. Uh, and then uh, sometimes you have to drain the sword out of the uh, secondary loop. So those kind of things. Um, but we're not expect those actions to be a, a safety, uh, to be important to safety. Um, so I want to point out that uh, uh, the Falcon 500 is a moderate design. So each plant has two power modules. And what, what we've shown here is just for one uh, module. And of course, each module will have their uh, independent control system uh, to some point, like uh, for the power module control, it will have its own system, but it also can share uh, some of the control systems like a support system, for, for example, uh, HVSE. Um, and then uh, of course we can have radiation monitoring systems. Uh, we also have a, a balance of plant control systems. So those control systems are uh, connected to sensors and the actuators, and also it connect to information network. And the information will be passed to the main control room. Uh, and Sorkong does have a backup control room. And the protecting system, uh, it's also connected to the main control room and backup control room directly. So if the network has some issue, uh, it won't affect the uh, protection system. Um, there may be, uh, it may be necessary to uh, provide information of the power plant to some control center uh, uh, either run by the government or run by SOCOM. Uh, it gives you uh, the overall overview of the uh, states. For example, uh, uh, some of the, uh, the government agencies may want to know the radiation levels uh, surrounding the area of the uh, power plant. So this uh, gives, gives the information. Okay, so let's locate uh, where the control system and where the main and backup control rooms are. Um, here is a um, view of the uh, uh, Sokan 500 looking port. So I hope you still remember the, uh, the basic terminologies of a ship. So, uh, because we're gonna use that to describe um, the power so basically the main control room is in this building here, uh, which is what we call the operation house, which is a superstructure uh, on top of the uh, main deck. Um, it's located at the port after corner. So here is the after, it's forward, and we're currently looking port. So this is where the main control room is. Uh, we do have a, a, a one backup control room for each power module, uh, which is located here. So this is uh, uh, after of the, uh, the cooling pond, and here's the main deck, uh, here's the HVSC deck. So here is uh, where the uh, backup control room located. Okay, so let's take a closer look. Uh, first of all, with the uh, main control room. So as I said, it's on the, uh, the corner, the after uh, port corner of the main deck. 
uh, there's a, a superstructure here we call the operation house. Uh, looking inside the house here, uh, you can see the, the operation deck, which is on the same level with the main deck. Uh, it's, uh, it's where the, uh, the control room is. So here's the control room. Uh, then there's also other supporting rooms uh, for the operation. Uh, okay, so okay. Uh, what about the backup control room and control systems room? So this is where the uh, uh, the backup uh, control room is, which also uh, uh, has the uh, control systems. Um, if you look here, now here is the uh, the working deck, which uh, is above the can uh, and above the uh, sort holding tank. So during the normal operation, uh, people can access this floor. Uh, they can uh, walk in uh, to the room here. As you can see, there's a, a, a controller for the pumps, and also there's a, a instrument panels. And this can be used a, a backup room, a backup control room. And underneath is the uh, HVSE system. Okay, here's a, a closer look of the backup control and the control system look. Uh, again, there's several decks here. Um, the, the bottom one is the HVSE, uh, which is not accessible. Um, during the power operation, but the, uh, uh, the silo deck uh, is accessible. The upper deck, of course, is accessible. So you can see there's uh, uh, controllers here. There's uh, uh, also a control panel and sensor panels there. So these two floors can be used as the, uh, the backup control room. And, and many of the uh, switchboard and controllers are also in these two decks here. Uh, so it's, it's quite, separated you have this main control room uh, in the uh, after uh, corner while you have this backup control room uh, in the forward section so it's uh, physically separated um, so uh, so the intention of this introduction is just to give you uh, a general introduction of the inc system uh, we're not going to cover the uh, the sensors we're not going to cover uh, the detailed technologies uh, of how we do the measurements uh, which uh, uh, we intend to uh, source the material technologies to measure the temperature uh, the the level uh, pressure and flow rate okay uh, that's it for today's uh, presentation. Um, I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Scott. That was very wonderful. Scott, before we go to the question, uh, since I'm the moderator, let me ask you the first questions. Uh, recently, in the uh, NRC, IAEA, there have been a word that's becoming popular that's called the walkway safety. Is this system, is the Thorpan system, by definition, can be considered walkway safety? Well, the walkway safety, it's, uh, uh, it requires a combination of uh, uh, several systems, including INC system, including uh, other safety systems. So uh, when we say walkway safety, um, up to this point, I believe Sorkan will be able to qualify uh, for that definition. But again, it requires not only INC, but also other uh, safety systems. Okay, is that now that terminology is an official terminology used by IAEA or not? Just like no, popular? No, no, no. I, I, okay. I think it's still a, a, a discussion topic. Um, okay. I, I'm not aware of any the IEA uh, uh, safety standard the code requires work, work away safety, or uh, I think people are still 
discussing what exactly that definition should be. Okay. Um, specifically, uh, IEA does not like the term walk away safety. What's they that? don't want to give a hint to the public that the operators will walk away. Uh, <laughs> they use the term instead, okay. a grace period. Okay. And the grace period is how long can a power plant survive right. without any intervention? Um, and so the grace period requirement has been increased from three days to seven days. And in our case, it's at least many, many months and maybe indefinitely. All right. Very good. Thank you very much. So let's go to the question here. In uh, the chat Bob, before yeah. we continue, we, we take a picture. I think. Oh, so. Okay. All right. So let's take a picture, everybody. Show your video. So uh, wouldn't take long. Uh, Yuri. Are you ready, Yuri? Yuri, you there? Okay. Epa. Show the word, say when, one, two, three. Okay, everybody. Okay. The first slide, one, two, three, smile. Yeah. Okay, the second slide, one, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you. Okay, that's it. Okay. All right, let's go to the chat room here. Good. We have the first one from Dr. Lim Pai Hong. Number one, you can read there, since the off-gas system contains huge amount of radiative fission product, which in conventional reactors are confined inside the fuel pellet. What is the safety concern of this system? And so on. Okay, so uh, let me start with the first question. Yes, uh, uh, as you pointed out, uh, in the conventional reactor, the, these uh, fission gases are confined in the, the fuel pins or, or the fuel, including the fuel pellet itself. Uh, in the, uh, the soil compound handle, uh, we deliberately remove um, those fission gases, mainly the, 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 uh, the neutron poisons out of the uh, uh, the fuel source, uh, in the hope that we could uh, again um, uh, a better neutronics performance. So uh, the question is is really about uh, where you want to keep those uh, uh, really active gases. So our approach is uh, let it flow through uh, the tanks. Uh, if you uh, notice that the pressure uh, of those tanks are very low. Uh, it's it's basically under two bar. Um, so we let it flow slowly at a very low pressure and decay uh, in those uh, uh, in those tanks. So let's let's uh, think about the situation. If if uh, the conventional fuel pin, um, if they get damage, um, you have this. Uh, 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 gases that will be released immediately from the system uh, with uh, pressure. So it will uh, facilitate the, the spread uh, of those gases uh, into the environment. Uh, in our case, uh, if we have a leak, say in the tank, uh, because it's not a pressurized, so it, it won't uh, spread as quick as the fuel pins. Um, also, because these uh, uh, tanks are separate in several uh, gas type sections, so you won't have a, a one, uh, say, single component that uh, which leak will give you a, a significant amount of uh, uh, radioactive materials. So you basically separate into several tanks. Uh, several type gas type sections. Uh, the chance that all the sections, all the, the tanks are failed at the same time is very slim. Uh, so, um, in, we, if we done a, a comprehensive analysis, if we do the safety assessment, uh, we will find uh, you know, our approach uh, will have a uh, we will have a less risk uh, compared to confined. Uh, contain all the radioactive material gases into uh, the fuel pins. I, I don't know if my uh, uh, answer has 
Let me address elaborate. Your, a little, yeah. yeah. Let me elaborate a little bit further. Um, the off gases are kept within the can, uh, which is our first uh, containment barrier. So that would be kind of similar to your fuel pin until they have decayed enough that the gases that leave there, there are radioactive noble gases that leave, but they have stable daughters. Um, so you only have noble radioactive material, noble gases as radioactive material that are leaving. Um, and so they are uh, both doubly contained and uh, ideal uh, dispersion. They don't bioaccumulate, they don't chemically react. Uh, so the risks from the release there are, I consider, considerably lower than in a light water reactor. Furthermore, uh, cesium is one of your major risks in any kind of release, and one of your major um, radioactive sources. And in fact, at this point in Fukushima, it's basically the only one. Um, and we have the copper fluoride to immediately chemically combine with the cesium to make it less mobile in the environment and, and keep it um, contained within the uh, OGRs, even in the event that they are uh, somehow uh, broken open. The other thing I'd mention is that these tanks are steel tanks that are at modest temperatures. Um, so they're very robust. They do not have the requirement that a light water re reactor fuel pin has of being very thin for good heat transfer. So the, uh, the, the container itself is much stronger than what you have in a light water reactor. In addition to the light water reactor, pin, fuel pins are under continuous neutron bombardment and relatively high pressure. Um, so the job of containing things in the fuel pins is much harder than we have. They've done a fantastic job, but uh, it's clear that the job they had to tackle was much harder than what we do. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on to uh, uh, Ms. Pan's uh, uh, second question. So the question is, especially for the subsystems of off gas, which are located outside of the can, what is the minimal physical barriers available? And what is the safety design philosophy for uh, those systems? Um, the answer is the safety design philosophy is consistent throughout the plant. So we have a multiple, multiple physical barriers. Uh, in this case, I, believe you're talking about the, uh, 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 the off-gas holding up tank. So those tanks and their, uh, their pipes are double wall uh, tanks and the pipes. So we already got two barriers. And then those tanks are located in the gas, gas tight section, uh, which is the uh, uh, secondary heat exchanger cell basement. So there's uh, three physical barriers. Uh, as as you can see from the, uh, uh, the diagram, uh, at any point, there's always uh, uh, three physical barriers. So um, the chances that the, all the barriers are, are, uh, are fading at the same time is very slim. Um, so, that will lead to the third question. The third question is, once a leakage event occur, uh, the contamination from the off gas is predicted would be severe and affected a wide area of the plant. Uh, in those cases, what is the possibility for uh, accessing and decom decontamination so that the plant can be operated again? Uh, we have considered this situation. So as you can see, um, each section uh, of the plant is gas, it's gas tight sections. So if you have a, any leak 
uh, in one of these uh, sections, it won't affect other sections. Uh, so that is the purpose to have this uh, the gas type section. Um, also, uh, there's detectors there. Uh, so any leak uh, will be detected. Um, remember those uh, the noble gases in the in the tanks. Uh, they even though they are gases, but they don't contribute significantly to the personal doses. Uh, and most of them are actually a short-lived uh, uh, noble gases. So I don't see uh, the chance that we're gonna uh, contaminate the a large section of the power plants because of the leak uh, from one of the uh, off-gas uh, system piping or, or components. Okay, is that sufficient, Pa Lin? I think it is. So okay, I think it's okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Pa Lin. So let's continue on to Zidney. Dear Dr. Okay. Toy. Yes, so... Um, oh, sorry. Uh, the, question, the question is, uh, uh, I assume that the fuel which has been used for eight years of cycle will be restored. Uh, in the used fuel holding tank and won't be used in any cycle. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yes, well, after eight years of uh, operation, the uh, fuel soil will not be reused in, a, in another can. Instead, it will be stored in the tanks, yes. Uh, but we believe the question, the follow-up question is, but we believe that it is still a precious material which contain a ton of useful radioisotopes obtained by an advanced extraction. Uh, my question are, number one, will future Sorkong Fishing Island be equipped with extraction or reprocessing facilities? Uh, number two, how will Sorkong extract and utilize this used fuel? Then, number three, what is the real waste of silicon reactor, uh, which should not be a problem, as you mentioned in the previous meeting? Um, okay, so let me try to answer this question, but uh, Lars, I guess, Lars will have uh, uh, more information on this. And so, yes, I agree with you. The, uh, even though we call the used fuel and we're not used uh, in the can, but it's still a, a very uh, precious material inside. Uh, it could be uh, extracted um, from uh, the used fuel. And of course, the Sorkan power plant currently does not have the equipment uh, to extract it. Uh, if, if, we, if we are going to do it, it's probably going to be uh, in a separate facility. Uh, how will Sorkan extract and utilize this used fuel? There are technologies uh, available currently in the world um, to do it. Uh, you know, whether we're going to do it, it's not only a, a technical decision, but it's also a economical and political decision, which I will let uh, Lars to uh, further elaborate this, this question. Okay, so the spent fuel has uh, still fairly decent enrichment uranium in it of significant value. So the, the spent fuel has uranium that's enriched to about 9% in it. So we very much would like to uh, extract it. Um, you would extract it by using fluorination, uh, same way they do when they process uranium ore and want to get it ready for enrichment. Um, so that's a very industrial process. However, um, this is also a big political question. Uh, the US is very active in trying to prevent uh, proliferation for nuclear weapons. And one way they do that is by strongly encouraging both with friendly and uh, threats 
other nations to agree to their uh, treaty that forbids the nations from reprocessing the fuel. Uh, these are called one, two, three agreements and Indonesia has signed it, which basically says Indonesia as a nation has promised not to reprocess the fuel. Um, so it is very much in our interest to go and get the uranium out of the spent fuel and use it some more. Um, but it will take a considerable uh, effort to work through the US bureaucracy to get a plant approved that we could do that with. Um, and it's not something that we can do even for at least 12 years after we start processing, after we start uh, commercial operations. So the spent fuel will still be there and we just haven't put a priority on working that part of the problem today. In addition to the uranium, there's also beryllium, which can be extracted with uh, vacuum distillation. Oak Ridge did this in the MSRE campaign, and the beryllium is worth maybe about 10% of what the uranium is worth. So it's still economical and attractive to go get that. There are other isotopes, um, many others, some of which we can identify some uses for, uh, others that may surprise us. So one of the surprises that has happened is um, actinium-225 has turned out to be uh, very useful in uh, cancer treatments. So they have figured out how to attach that particular nucleide to a carrier that the body will carry directly to cancer cells and it attaches itself almost exclusively to cancer cells. And when that one decays, it decays with a pure alpha decay, which means it gives off a very heavy uh, energetic particle, but one that's big. It's basically a helium atom with no, no electrons, an alpha particle. And that will kill the cell that it's in. Uh, so it's a way of treating cancer that holds great promise. Nobody imagined actinium-225 would be particularly valuable, but now it, it's probably the most valuable substance in the world. Um, and Bill Gates just bought the supply of it to uh, be able to supply people with that. But what the next invention is, I don't know. Um, so yes, there is a lot of different things rather exotic materials in the spent fuel. Um, the thorium and the sodium are also perfectly fine. They could be recycled. They aren't very expensive, so it's not economic to recycle them, but if it's important to a nation, we can do that. Uh, eventually though, you're gonna have some left uh, fission products and transuranics in your waste stream. There will be some, but it's important to recognize that is true for anything we do. We will always generate something. Uh, so we got to not compare against being perfect and generating absolutely no waste. We got to say, is this waste modest? Is it something we can handle well? And even with today's reactors with no reprocessing, um, the waste for a lifetime worth of electricity will fit in a one liter bottle. So it's very practical to keep it well contained. And we have done worldwide. We've, we've, we've contained the, the waste from nuclear power plants very well. They've never hurt anybody. Um, we're still fussing over what to do with it eventually. Um, but that's a topic for probably not my generation, probably not my kids. It's something that it'll wait there. We can, we can keep it stored, essentially dry cast storage for as long as we want to. In our plans, we've got it so it's stored inside the hull until the politics have cleared enough that we can have a rational discussion about what to do with it. Okay. Did that answer the question? I think there is a next question from Mr. Petit. Okay. 
Okay, okay. So uh, in this case, uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, the next question, uh, there's two questions actually. Uh, first one is, is oxygen scribing is needed to reduce corrosion? Uh, second question is, why do you use nickel and titanium? Uh, remove oxygen and tritium, while as far as I know, uh, nickel and uh, titanium alloy oops, moving, uh, are very good corrosion resistant due to their stable oxide layer. Uh, okay, so uh, let me start with the first question. And yes, we all know that uh, oxygen is very important in terms of a, a, a control the corrosion of the system. And so the oxygen will be generated through fission. Uh, it will also might be some uh, 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 in leak of oxygen from the environment. And however, the uh, the SOCON system is designed such that it will sustain uh, the corrosion for the four years design lifetime. So even without uh, extra systems, uh, Sorcon uh, components, the primary loop, the can, can the filtering tank can uh, survive four years, and that I mean that's one of the benefits that you replace your your core every every four years, and the corrosion is well controlled during that four years. So why we're still uh, doing this uh, this oxygen removal? So um, this actually related to the second question here. Um, uh, you are absolutely right. Um, nickel and titanium will react with uh, oxygen to form the oxide layer. So that's why we have both nickel and titanium here. So uh, the ox gas will flow through nickel first. Uh, it will form the nickel oxides. Uh, in this process, the oxide uh, the oxygen will be removed. And then the oxygen-free cover gas will uh, get into the titanium. And because there's no oxygen, so uh, titanium won't form the oxide layer. Uh, the titanium will uh, react with uh, uh, hydrogen, including uh, tritium, um, to remove it. So that's, how, that's why we have both nickel and titanium uh, in the system. So we have to go through, the off gas has to go through nickel first, then to titanium. Of course, uh, the another benefit of having uh, this system is also reduce the oxygen level uh, in the uh, cover gas. So in turn, it will help uh, the corrosion control, but uh, it's not required. Uh, Bob, are you trying to say something? You're you're muted. Sorry, there is a follow-up question there. How much DPA do you expect from your component? Okay, so uh, I I can uh, answer the the second one. Uh, yes, the pod is removed and replaced uh, every uh, four-year cycle. But for the DPA uh, value, I don't have it in hand. Um, I don't know if Lars, you have that. That value? I don't remember it. I do remember that the primary concern was uh, the nickel uh, interacting with neutrons and forming helium that would migrate towards grain boundaries. And that would limit the lifetime of the pot to about 12 years. Uh, the DPAs were low enough that that wasn't a concern because just remember the pot is on the very periphery of the core. It's not like a light water reactor where you have uh, steel elements that are in the center of the neutron flux. But I don't recall the DPAs that we had. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, Bob, I suggest we write down this question, uh, we'll right. go back and uh, find out the, the DPA values. Okay, so we put this on for week, uh, week seven, Patagoria. All right, yeah. so next question from Helen. 
how is the strategy to comply with non-proliferation issue of the fuel transfer system? Yes, so uh, the so our our approach is to engage uh, the IEA uh, in the early stage. At um, I don't know if Bob you have introduced that uh, we're engaging with the IEA um, at this point. So uh, by getting IEA uh, involved from the early phase of its design, we'll be able to uh, incorporate the uh, non-proliferation or safeguards requirements into the design. And also uh, there's opportunity for us to work with the uh, national regulators uh, such as Babaton uh, to understand the Indonesian requirements uh, and to uh, incorporate those requirements into the power plan. Um, the other thing know, Lars, you have now, anything to add here? Yeah, the, all, all the fuel transfer is happening by pumps that are driven by pressurized gas. So the fuel salt always stays in the basement below the um, rad tank and the uh, fuel salt cask, transfer cask hatches. Those hatches are uh, sealed by IAEA and monitored by them. You cannot get to any fuel without opening those hatches, and there is no reason to open those hatches in any uh, hurry. You, there's no accident where you need to open those hatches. So um, the if someone ever were to open those hatches without first notifying IEA and giving them an opportunity to be present, then you are immediately aware that they're doing something strange and, and uh, you need to call on uh, that, that they are going outside of their legal boundaries as far as proliferation goes. Now, what you do then is not up to the, the reactor community. That's gonna be uh, up to the international community. All right, so you're saying that in the field transfer, actually uh, the non-proliferation issue is kind of non-issue because of the, the heavy barrier. Uh, non-issue is, is too strong a statement. Okay. Um, it, Less than it, the issue. You, you cannot get to the fuel without um, doing it, but you still have proliferation issues to work through because unlike a light water reactor, uh, the fuel changes mass, it changes composition over time. And it's not simply counting how many fuel pins to do your accountancy. Accountancy is more difficult with a liquid fuel reactor. So there are some issues to work through, which is common with all molten salt reactors. Um, and they're, they're working on it. Um, all right. So, so I wouldn't say it's a non-issue, but it is an issue that's being actively worked and they will have a solution. Okay, very good. So next question for Bu Nur Samsi. In the case of accident okay. occur. Yeah, the question is uh, in case of accident occur, uh, how will the off gas system work? Uh, is there an engineered safety feature to control the airborne uh, radioactive release? So, uh, so we do this, we uh, do this by using uh, passive barriers. So uh, each, uh, we always keep uh, at least uh, three physical barriers. Um, for example, the first two barriers are the uh, double wall tank or piping. Um, there's detectors there. If there's a leak from the first uh, wall to the uh, space between the double wall tanker, we'll be able to to know, and if we know that, uh, we will turn off the valve uh, to stop the system, to do the uh, the maintenance, and to and to fix it. So it won't uh, the the leak won't be uh, going to uh, will be going out uh, from the second barrier. Um, there, with with this passive system, multiple passive barriers, uh, won't we won't be uh, needing the a special engineered safety feature. 
uh, to control uh, the the release of the uh, uh, of the off gases. All right, so I guess that's answered it, Bu Samsi. I hope that's satisfied. So next one from Lukman Pradana. How about the okay. safety radiation? Okay, the safe. Uh, I guess the question uh, was about how about the uh, the doses. Uh, yeah, that will be uh, that the operators and workers will receive. So uh, we will be following uh, the uh, reading the safety limits and management limits that are set by Batacan. Uh, we don't expect uh, 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 a dose that uh, much higher than uh, other uh, nuclear power plants. I think we'll be doing very good uh, on that. As you can see in the power plant, we have a, a large chunk of a, a steel uh, body of water and lead and concrete. So we're not, uh, you know, we're, we have a lot of shielding material and, and those, especially for operators, operators and workers in the backup room. Um, uh, so if you see the, uh, uh, the layout, um, you can see there's a, a, a very, um, big and thick uh, bore the water rather tank uh, on top of the can. So that is specifically designed to shield the can. And the dose rates above the, uh, the rat tank, it, it's very low. Uh, we don't expect uh, uh, a, a big dose contribution from the, the can during the normal, during the normal operation. Um, and then there's another question is that, uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, reusing the fuel source? Um, I assume uh, you mean the uh, reuse of the fuel source after four years, pump it to another can uh, to use it for uh, four years. Uh, if if that was if that was a question, then obviously there's two benefits of it. Uh, first of all, um, by reusing the fuel source, you can uh, use uh, more fissile material in the fuel source, so you save the money. Um, and then the second benefit is uh, the more you reuse the fuel source, the less uh, volume of waste salt you would generate from the operation. So it, it, it benefits both e economically and also benefit on the, uh, the waste management. But in turn, it will also uh, benefit you uh, economically. Okay, I think that's answered it. So there is a comment from uh, Dr. Petit. Yes, correct, Lars. Nickel is so prone to helium embrittlement. I asked the DPA level to know the radiation damage and the effect of embrittlement to the metals. So Lars, do you want to have more comment there or? Okay, no. All right, very good. So go to Dr. Petit, another question. If possible and may not know needed to be addressed today, next week it's fine. What is the corrosion rate do we expect on the pot? What is about, the corrosion rate? About 25 microns per year. 25 microns per year. All right. So, so that, that would be the depth of uh, chromium depletion. So that the, the whole metal is not disappearing, but you get the chromium gets um, migrates out and gets carried away from the surface. So that's about 25 microns per year after the first year. In after the first year, you get a lot more because there's a lot more chromium right at the uh, surface. All right, uh, is that answer the question, Dr. Petit? So that is the last question in the chat room. So uh, anybody want to? raise questions or just speak out. We can still have some time here. Nothing, nobody? Okay, going once, Patagor. Okay, so I think going once, going twice. Okay, no more questions. Okay, guys. So Patagor, please, uh, what are the resume of today's meeting? Let's Patagor resume the questions here. Yeah, uh, uh, I think uh, just uh, uh, this resume is uh, 
for weeks five is uh, just uh, make a, a short note from the presentation of Dr. Kuhn. First, we see that the topics on the field transfer of gas and IC have been presented in the week five, because as we know that MSR using fuel in liquid form, in liquid phase, I think seven or 50% uh, from 14 normal operating modes are related with the fuel transfer. A simple fuel transfer diagram has been presented by Dr. Kuhn. Uh, fuel transfer in the can, fuel drain tank on and out of uh, fuel drain tank have been presented as well. Uh, the fuel is transferred to the pot through the heater tank. I think this is the key of the how we uh, transfer from one uh, uh, through, uh, I think from if you go to the pot, it should be through the heater tank. And we find also that there is a manifold with fast that directs the salt flow with one source and one destination. A connection to the manifold include can A fuel drain tank and also can B fuel drain tank in can B, a heater tank in can A and heater tank in can B, holding tank, transfer gas, and fall. Uh, the next uh, term as 500 is the selenium as a capital gas for transfer of fuel salt, dry seal, and removal of gases, neutron poison. Uh, the main function of gas systems are supply and circulate helium capital gas, cool D of gas, and return most of the heat to the primary loop, remove and contain radioactive isotopes, separate krypton and xenon from helium, remove other unwanted gases, mist and particles. And the control philosophy uh, is, uh, I think there's a, a Torcon 500 uh, uh, control philosophy different from the, uh, the LWR due to the intrinsic characteristic of the plan. The power control system is a loading uh, is a load following system, and it's not important to the safety. Uh, the Torcon 500 uh, uses automatic automation uh, to replace most manual input from the operator, and I think uh, we can see the operator have limited required functions, in just uh, interface with grid, change the operating modes configure a plan for maintenance, initiate a scram or drain, activate non-nuclear emergency system. And the last uh, ballots, I think, uh, the location of main and backup control rooms. Uh, we see that the main control rooms is in the operation house, super superstructure located at the port off corner of the main deck. And one back control room for each power module is located uh, half of the decay heat cooling pond between main deck and uh, uh, half acid deck. That's the resume that I just noted from the presentation. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patagor. So, uh, Kun, last, uh, last words before we close. One minute. Uh, let me start with saying thank you all very much uh, for uh, the uh, excellent questions and your patience. You have been a a, a wonderful audience and participants uh, for the past several weeks. Uh, so next week we're going to have a, our last uh, last uh, presentation, which regarding uh, the safety assessment and some of the DBAs we have uh, studied up to this point. So I'm looking forward to see you next week. Thank you, Lars. Last, last. Well, and thank you all. So many of you are. So many of you are participating and uh, working in the evening. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Remember, next week is very exciting. We're going to talk about station blackout. So be there. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Yo, semuanya. Bye -bye. Assalamualaikum. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, yeah. thank you, Professor. Thank you, Lars. Thank you. Thank you, John. See you next week. Thank you.